Let us pray. Heavenly Father, we come to you today knowing that a lot of times we like to do things for ourselves. We are stubborn. We have a way of doing that, God. We can get hard-headed. But help us, God, realize that there are so many things that we cannot do, that we were not even meant to do, that you did and accomplished for us. So help us continue to joyfully know and receive and believe in all the things that you've accomplished for us, your children. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. So when I was growing up, there was a hobby that I really liked to do. One that, if you know me now, might seem a little surprising, a little even misplaced. Something I really liked to do as a kid was build model airplanes. Now, if you were unaware, these are little kits you would get from the store. Right now, I think the only place I've ever seen them again is at Hobby Lobby. These little kits that have plastic that you would follow step-by-step -step instructions to put together this model. Now, they'd also be held together, of course, by this super sticky glue. So you really only had one shot to get it right because you were not separating that glue once the glue was put together. So once your plane was put together, your final step would then be painting it. It would give you the different description. You could paint it any type of design you wanted. But not me. I wanted to look exactly like the box. I would look at the numbers, and you could get these certain numbers and bring them into the paint place and get the little things that were exactly the color and the tone to match what was on the box. Now, this might seem a little strange to you because you've heard me preach about sports probably quite a lot. You've heard me talk even about band once or acting, but crafts are not really my thing. I was even joking last week at Vacation Bible School how I never really liked crafts. I, I struggled to do crafts all the time. I was the kid who was still doing crafts for five to ten minutes when I just wanted to be outside playing games. But I kept trying, and I had this hobby that I really enjoyed model airplanes. Now, more than anything else, what I really liked was World War II airplanes, just like the one pictured there, P-51 Mustang. That one is hard to beat. But there were, however, a couple problems with my little hobby that I really enjoyed doing. First, I was not patient at all. These planes were difficult. You had to go step by step. You couldn't jump ahead. You would have followed the directions, and I didn't really love doing that. The second problem, as I said, is I wanted it to be perfect. If the box looked like this, I wanted my plane to look exactly like that. Well, when I did this hobby, I was like eight, nine, ten years old. I imagine my middle son right now, Micah, doing one of these. I'm like, there is no way that would turn out necessarily well. Even though he likes puzzles, I don't think he is doing models anytime soon. But the regular thing ended up happening when I did these models. I would keep going back to my dad and asking for help. Anytime I'd have a problem with anything, anytime something wasn't working exactly right, I'd run back to my dad to do it. And I remember there was a number of times during summer where my dad had been outside working, he was a lineman in the heat, he was exhausted, and I would want to finish my model airplane right when he got home. So I'd keep running back and forth with him. This regular refrain would happen. Hey, Dad, can you help me? Dad, can you help me? Dad, can you help me? Finally, my dad would say, fine. Give it here. I'll do it myself. My dad would meticulously work on it, finish, and give me back my plane. It was done. My model, my plane, was finished. I couldn't, but my father could. See, a similar story could be applied in what we're looking at today when we look at Jesus and us. Because God's people could not follow his commands. They couldn't read and follow the instructions. God's people also couldn't heed his repeated warnings to them. God's voice almost had seemingly gone hoarse. Because we talked last week, we did this seamless transition from the Old Testament to the New Testament. Did you know there was 400 years in there that no prophets, no one spoke? It's like God had gotten so tired of telling his people what they were going to do, but they didn't do it, that he went silent. And the people were left waiting to see what is God going to do next. So this week is kind of that week where God says, okay, I'm going to push up my sleeves, and I'm going to send my son Jesus to do the work. This is God's let me have it, let me do it moment. God putting on flesh and coming among us. Which brings us to our scripture today and the two stories of Jesus' baptism and Jesus' testing. Now, as I look at these two stories, there's one big question that I like asking for both of them. Why does Jesus need to do this? So first, we have his baptism. 
Now, this seems peculiar just because of how we view and what we receive in our baptisms. See, in our baptism, we baptize and we remember the forgiveness we received from our sins, just like I talked about in the children's message. We also celebrate the Holy Spirit coming into our lives. Those are kind of the main two things. But then we look at Jesus. Jesus was without sin. We didn't really need it for that. And, okay, he's Jesus, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. They've been together the whole time. So it isn't like he needs to get the Holy Spirit. He's always had the Holy Spirit with him. So then why? Why did Jesus need to get baptized? Well, in his baptism, Jesus identifies with us. While Jesus didn't need the forgiveness for sins, he is identifying with us and our sins and our failures. He's showing that he is going to step in as our substitute. He is going to do what we could not. And also in this moment, we see that Jesus is from God, and at the same time, Jesus is God. Because after Jesus is baptized, right when he comes up out of the water, his father says this, This is my son, whom I love. With him, I am well pleased. Think of all the times in the Old Testament that God spoke with his people. Generally, he was not well pleased. He was angry. He was disappointed in his people from straying away. But that's no longer present when the Father speaks of Jesus. Because Jesus is going to be different. What Jesus is going to do is actually going to please the Father. So as we move forward in the text, the next thing we see is Jesus testing. So why does Jesus, of all people, need to be tested? So Jesus' text starts, he's led to the desert by the Spirit. So first we see this testing is not an accident. This is intentional. This is part of Jesus' ministry. But something does seem strange, because this is the same Spirit who was just at Jesus' baptism, and now he's taking him out. He descends like a dove. Now he leads him out into the middle of nowhere for 40 days and 40 nights. And then what happens next? Well, the devil then enters the picture. The devil comes to test Jesus. Now, this isn't the first time the devil's shown up in our sermon series, Long Story Short. No, he's a familiar foe. Way back in the beginning, this is the same devil who caused Adam and Eve to sin in the garden and thrust the whole world into sin. Now the devil's going to go against Jesus. So the devil starts his assault by saying, if you are the Son of God. Now, this is important here. He isn't asking the question, is he the Son of God? No, the devil's cunning. The devil knows that Jesus is the Son of God. The devil's a worthy adversary. What he's really asking is saying this, since you are the Son of God, prove it. If you really are God, why don't, why don't you show me? I would love to see you do something amazing. So what challenge does he give Jesus? He says, take these rocks and turn them into bread. Now, the question here is not, can Jesus do this? This would be so easy for Jesus to do. I mean, later in his ministry, Jesus is going to take a few fish, a few bread, and feed thousands and thousands of people. In the Old Testament, God literally rains bread down from heaven to provide for his people in the desert. This isn't even scratching the surface on what Jesus could do. But in this moment, Jesus knows this is way more than just about food. He responds, man shall not live on bread alone but on every word that comes from the mouth of God. Although Jesus has been fasting, not eating for 40 days, to him in this moment, words from God are more important than food. I mean, personally, I, I'm, I'm taking the food. Just going to be honest. Like, that is my temptation. That is one I give in to often. But here Jesus says, no, it's not about that. And Jesus' response is not random either. He's not just making up words on the spot. No, his words come from Scripture, from the book of Deuteronomy. Each of his responses are going to be Scripture-led. Again, the Word of God, that is what is living, and that is what Jesus uses to respond. But the devil doesn't stop. So when he tempted Adam and Eve, he only needed to say one thing. He only needed to test them once. With Jesus, he needs to do more. So now the devil asked Jesus to cast himself down because the angels would protect Jesus. Now this temptation always seemed weird to me. What, what is he asking? What is he doing? Where is he getting this from? Well, in this we see that Jesus isn't the only one who can quote scripture. That's what the devil's doing here in the second t testing. He is quoting Psalm 91. As I said, the devil is a worthy foe. Jesus, though, again, rebuffs the devil again with Scripture from Deuteronomy. Do not put the Lord your God to the test. 
But finally, the devil's not done. He wants one more swing. He gets his three strikes. He takes Jesus to the highest mountain. Shows him all the kingdoms of the world, everything. All this the devil will give to Jesus if only he worships him. No big deal. Just, just worship me and you can have all of this. This testing goes right to the first commandment. That first commandment that God's people have broke over and over and over again. You shall have no other gods. But Jesus responds accordingly, Away from me, Satan! It is writ written, Worship the Lord your God and serve him only. So three tests, three temptations, whatever you want to call them, after 40 days and 40 nights, all by himself in a desert, and Jesus resists. We couldn't, but Jesus could. In Jesus' testing with the devil, Jesus distinguishes himself. Jesus is going to be different. Unlike us, he's not going to cave in to testing or temptation. Although he is in a sinful world ruled by the devil, Jesus will not be ruled by the evil one. He's also not going to be like the other leaders in the Old Testament who held the hope of the people for a little while and then it was dashed away by their own sinfulness, their own selfishness. Jesus would instead represent the people as the new Israel. He'd represent the entire nation, and he would do what the entire nation could not do. He would perfectly keep the laws that God had placed upon his people. Because Jesus was fulfilling the righteousness that they could not. This is what we also see in his baptism. This is the explanation he gives John when John is totally confused, which he's like, John's like, time out, Jesus. No, I'm not, I'm not supposed to baptize you. It's supposed to be the other way around. And Jesus says, no. This is intentional. This is to fulfill all righteousness. Jesus has come to not make himself righteous, but to make us righteous. See, he's going to do this by not only resisting the devil on this day, but throughout his entire ministry. See, as we look into our lives, we're reminded that we can't or won't resist. We don't need 40 days and 40 nights to fall away. We can't resist firing back a comment to someone else when we're hurt. We can't resist letting anger build up and we see a failure that someone else has. We can't help but just smile a little bit. Or we can't help but be jealous when we see someone else on that vacation or doing something else. We wish only we could do that. Even on our very best days, we fall woefully short of the glory of God. And we can keep trying, but we are going to keep failing just like God's people did throughout the Old Testament. However, God doesn't see us like that. God doesn't see us as failures. We're not seen as failures because of Jesus. See, in these two stories, we see Jesus stand in our place as our substitute. First, in his baptism, a baptism where he didn't need the repentance or the forgiveness, Jesus gets into the water with us. See, it wasn't just enough for Jesus to come into this world, he also was going to go through this world with us. Just imagine, this is the parent who's, they're playing with their kid in the water. They're not just watching them. They are in there. They are holding them. They are protecting them. They are making sure they have fun. This is the kid jumping off the side of the pool and the parent is catching them. Jesus is in the water with us. This is what Luther said. In baptism, we daily die and rise with Christ. We're joined with him. We're righteous not because of us, but we're righteous because of Jesus and what he did for us. And then in Jesus' testing or his temptation, we see that Jesus accomplishes also what we could not. He resists everything. The devil had Jesus at his physical weak weakest after he'd been alone for 40 days, 40 nights, had been hungry, yet Jesus overcomes. He responds with words from the Bible and to each attack that the devil makes. Where Adam and Eve were felled with one question from the devil when they were at their strongest, Jesus does not falter at his weakest. Jesus resists. And we find out everything we need to know about why Jesus was here. Jesus was here, as that hymn said, for us. Jesus was here to do what we couldn't do. Jesus was going to live a perfect life and be our substitute. All these failures of mankind would finally be made right. Not by mankind himself, but by what Jesus would accomplish for them. This was God's give it here, let me do it moment. This is what Jesus announces through his baptism and through the testing he receives from the devil. 
because God had always been there. In the Old Testament, though, he was sometimes hidden. He was behind the scenes. He was always working. Now God is going to be very visible and very present in his ministry in Jesus. Because Jesus was that. He was true God and true man, 100% of both. We couldn't. Jesus can. See, like us, we're going to see throughout the next couple weeks, is Jesus was true man. He was hungry. He felt sadness. He felt temptation. He felt loss. He's going to need to eat, sleep, drink, and even go to the bathroom. But unlike us, Jesus is going to resist all temptation. He's going to resist all evil. He's only going to act out in love, and all Jesus' words are going to be matched with his actions. And this battle, this testing with the devil is not going to be the last time they meet as adversaries. There's going to be another confrontation that happens on the cross. Jesus is once again there going to be lonely and hungry and suffering. And this time the Father's not going to say, this is my son whom I love. No. This time the Father's going to turn his face away. The whole world is going to go dark for hours. Jesus will breathe his last and give up his life. And at this moment, it will look like maybe, just maybe, the devil has finally won. What he couldn't accomplish in the wilderness, in the desert, he will complete on the cross. God in the flesh, Jesus dies. Like the devil had won the battle against mankind on the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, it'll look like he's won the battle again on the cross of Calvary. Yet, we know the truth. We know that this was not the end. It isn't the end because Jesus is also God. He's eternal. He's the Alpha, the Omega, the beginning and the end. Something eternal cannot remain dead. Jesus would rise again. He would defeat not just death, but the devil himself. And Jesus' resurrection would not just be for himself, but for all of us. This is the beautiful words that Paul pens in Romans 6. Or don't you know that all of us who were baptized in Jesus Christ were baptized into his death? We were therefore buried with him through baptism into death in order that just as Christ was raised from the dead through the glory of the Father, we too may have new life. For if we have been united with him in death like this, we will also certainly be united with him in a resurrection like this. We couldn't, but Jesus could. Jesus came into this world to unite us with him once again. That's why a lot of time when we talk about Jesus' relationship with the church, it's described as a bride and a groom. The two become one. We are united with Christ because of Christ. I like to make this analogy when I'm teaching my confirmation kids about Jesus and the victory that he wins. If we think of it like this, of course, again, in sports terms, Jesus is on the field. And he's doing all the work. He's scoring all the points. We're on the bench, but here's the thing. We're not even cheering on the bench. We are sitting there with our hands crossed just watching in awe of what he is doing. He is scoring all the points. He's playing all the defense. He is doing everything. We are contributing nothing. And the game ends. Jesus is, of course, victorious. He gets the trophy, but he doesn't keep it to himself. He walks over to the bench. He hands the trophy to us. We sit there shocked, thinking we did nothing to deserve this trophy. We didn't even cheer when he was scoring the points. We did nothing. We don't deserve this. And Jesus says, this is yours. This is what I earned for you. This is the God taking it back moment, saying this is something that only I can do. Let me take it. Let me do it for you. And that trophy is the crown of righteousness. That trophy is eternal life. And that trophy is only because of Jesus. Jesus doesn't keep the victory to himself, but instead he gives all the rewards to us, his children. We couldn't, but Jesus could. Amen.